Artisan Conversation, Visibility. Wyndham City and Wyndham Art Gallery acknowledges the peoples of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which Wyndham Art Gallery stands and on which this podcast was recorded on. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and future. Welcome to Go Deeper, Wyndham Art Gallery's podcast channel, part of our Go Deeper program that provides an in-depth look at each of our exhibitions. Today you're listening to an abridged recording of the Visibility Artisan Conversation. This was a panel discussion held between the two guest co-curators, Pauline Batuna and Hannah Morphy Walsh, with two of the exhibiting artists, Ruby Allegra and Lilani Fumono, on December 4th, 2019, at Wyndham Art Gallery. Visibility was an incredible exhibition that was a celebration of identities, minds, and bodies as artists who identify as having a disability made the visible and marginalized visible. The exhibition asked the audience to consider how values, assumptions, and falsehoods embedded in our culture and systems discriminate against people with disability, and what might be possible when those assumptions are challenged. Featuring work by Jasmine O, oh, Ibi Ibrahim, Annie Moores, Nino Amum, Ruby Allegra, Don Iris Dangkoman, Lilani Fumono, Marani Kalavokawasa, and Morag 17, Undulating Roses. A transcript of this audio can be found on our website. Please view our profile for the link. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy. My name is Pauline Vituna. I was one of the curators of this exhibition, along with Hannah, who's, um, for the purposes of the podcast, is sitting next to me. Um, I'm going to allow everyone to introduce themselves. So first, I'm going to hand the mic to Hannah. I'm Hannah, one of the co-curators of the exhibition, um, and it has been truly a pleasure to this whole experience has been amazing. Um, and sitting next to me, we have Leila. I'm Leilani. Uh, I'm from, I was born on Noongar country. I reside on Bunurong Woiwurrung country. And um, I did some art for this exhibition. I'm Ruby. I live and work on Ghana land in South Australia. And I've come over to um, Melbourne specifically for this exhibition. Glad to be here. Okay, so let's get into it. I want to start by just talking about the art that you guys produced. Incredible art. Um, so we can start with you, Ruby. Um, could you talk about the work that you have in this exhibition? Yeah, I've got um, a few different pieces in the exhibition. I have a uh, triptych I did called um, Protest, and uh, that's a digital uh, text base. Uh, work which kind of um, explores themes around um, ableism and um, kind of pays tribute to uh, protest for disabled people because I think that's something that's not talked about a lot um, within the disabled community or with regards to access. And I think it's something that a lot of disabled people aren't given access to, is to protest and to say no and to question and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I have a couple of other digital based pieces, um, the Unbound piece, which is a continuous line work, which kind of focuses on uh, stepping away from the language surrounding the use of mobility aids as being restrictive or something that um, people are bound to, wheelchair bound, bed bound, confined to, um, because I think my mobility aid does the opposite of binding me to anything. I've got a more comedic piece called Ode to My Wheelchair, which kind of, uh, it's just a little love letter from me to my wheelchair. A few people have had a little bit of a giggle when they've had a look at it because um, it's quite relatable to, I think, a, lo a lot of other wheelchair users of the various ways in which a, a wheelchair or other mobility aid can be used in more unorthodox ways, usually by my cats. Um, and then I've got another uh, trilogy piece, um, Icons, which is an ink-based uh, black and white line um, illustration uh, of three portraits of uh, disabled people that I quite admire and consider to be an icon for me. So one of the people that I il illustrated in, in the icons, 
pieces um, is um, Frida Kahlo, who was a Mexican painter and a political activist and um, acquired a disability due to an accident um, during her life. And um, I think something that struck a chord with me was that um, her image has been reproduced so much throughout history and has become commercialized, I guess, and capitalized on. Um, but it focuses on her with a very specific lens. Um, and often that's quite whitewashed. Often that's um, quite focusing entirely on her physical appearance in terms of, you know, the, the flowers or the um, braids that she would wear in her hair and her facial hair, her um, unibrow, her jewellery, um, and kind of focuses a lot on the surface level kind of beauty, but conforms her to non-disabled people's ideals of what beauty is and, and what it should be. And having done a little bit of research about her, I, I feel like she would kind of hate that, uh, hate the way that she has been so frequently portrayed. Um, and so the image that I chose to kind of illustrate of her depicts her lying in bed, um, painting on her own um, cast that she had on her torso um, and creating art that way. And I think that really kind of stuck with me because it was a view of her that a lot of people don't see it, a lot, a lot of people don't know about um, because she spent quite a lot of time in bed um, and in a lot of pain. And, and that's actually, you know, a theme that's explored uh, very frequently in a lot of her artwork. Leilani, you have two collaborative works in the exhibition. Could you talk about those? Yeah, we did the photo series with Nino um, that we shot here. And my second work was with Morak, my best friend, um, and it's sculptural work made from mirror and wire. Um, it's in the back cabinets, there's five of them. There's actually a narrative for all of it, which you probably can't take away from looking at it, but it's, yeah, very close to us and um, really explores, like, the depths of our friendships and what we've been through as two um, disabled and chronically ill best friends. Um, it really explores dissociative identity disorder, um, complex trauma and how it refracts and distorts memories and um, your sense of self and your sense of identity and that's why we used like the broken pieces of mirror. It was really wonderful to do both of the works. They both mean so much to me in, in different ways. I also want to ask you about um, producing the photo shoot. Yes. Because you guys are so resourceful. <laughs> Yeah, it's just a wonderful thing the way um, disabled and chronically ill people support each other um, because, yeah, all the equipment that we use to create the shoot was from my wonderful other really close friend, Elliot Lauren, who is um, a photographer and she is um, chronically ill as well and she makes the most beautiful, she makes the most beautiful works and I'm definitely don't consider myself a photographer by any means. Elliot is like a real professional gal. So it was such a like, it meant so much to me that she was like, you know, trusting enough of me and um, of what we were trying to create. Ruby and I met, um, I think twice this year before <laughs> um, the actual exhibition. And um, I mean, I've been having these conversations for a while with um, you know, other disabled friends and, um, and just people generally. Um, and there's this strong, there's a strong part of me that's like, wants to understand, you know, why? Why is it so, like, not just where the lack of compassion comes from, but like, why, why is disability itself so actively feared, so actively hated? I mean, the whole exhibition really was about sort of, instead of doing this performative, like explanatory, this is what disability is, don't be afraid of us anymore. Um, I completely just snapped. And again, this is like 
due to the many, many disabled you know, artists who have come before me. Um, and just sort of being able to just speak honestly, um, you know, like to each other um, and not caring, not caring about pandering to an abled audience for our needs. Something you can see in a lot of the pieces as well is that it's not, uh, it doesn't have that same kind of lens caring about how, what the reception would be like from a non-disabled audience. Like it's very much by and for the disabled community rather than kind of being like, oh, like let's present our nicest, like most palatable versions of ourselves and our community to non-disabled audiences so that they enjoy our art and consume it in the way that they would non-disabled art work and artists. I actually just wanted to explore freedom of association even. Um, like, what, like, what does it actually mean to be speaking to other disabled people? This whole thing has been, like, really life-changing for me. Um, working with disabled curators and making art with my other chronically ill bestie and working with lots of disabled and chronically ill people, it's just I've never um, been given the space or the... Um, you know, no one's ever made that space for me, really, to speak openly, but, like, create openly, I suppose. Um, you know, I've been in art spaces for a long time, um, a lot of different artistic scenes and music and whatever. There's, And they've all been, you know, able-bodied, centred, non-disabled art spaces, and there's never been any much room for me in those spaces, and... I've never had the um, confidence to begin to create works that speak to my experience and speak to the experience of, um, you know, my disabled friends. And yeah, so it has been like life changing. I, I don't know how we gauge into that more, but I'm excited to make more art now. I think communication amongst and within and between disabled people uh, brings a different level of intimacy. Uh, there's that access intimacy, which is talked about quite a lot of the innate kind of understanding, even though it might be from different perspectives and with different lenses and filters of, of people, you know, being from different intersecting backgrounds, there's still that kind of innate understanding of what it means to exist in the world, having access requirements and um, experiencing ableism in all of its many different forms. Um, so I think uh, anytime I'm interacting or conversing with other disabled people, there is a, a certain level of intimacy that I, I can't achieve with non-disabled people, regardless of how close to them I might be. Um, they could be my best friends in the whole world and there still won't be that that connection that I'd have with another disabled person that I might have met once that day and we can instantly connect about things. So I think, um, you know, having that space and that, and that um, encouragement to kind of uh, spread my roots, I guess, and not, um, not, there isn't that sense of comparison that I might, have placed upon myself within spaces that are cent centred around uh, the non-disabled experience. And, you know, this is the first uh, time that I've been to an exhibition or been involved in an exhibition focusing on disabled artists or including any disabled artists, really, um, apart from myself, um, that has also had involvement from disabled curators which I think is really wonderful. But it's kind of shocking to me that, that it was so unfamiliar to me. Um, I think coming from Adelaide, there's a, a lot smaller kind of art community over there in general. And even more so if you are queer, even more so if you are trans, disabled, person of colour, indigenous, and especially if you are any multiple intersections. 
but that's what makes our community so wonderful because we have empathy for each other. And similar to what you, you were talking about with um, you know, organising your photo shoot and um, you know, disabled people supporting each other kind of without question because we do have that understanding. Um, yeah, so I think that's been a very important uh, kind of step in my development as an artist and growth in my confidence as an artist that I didn't necessarily have before. Like now I'm like, okay, like I deserve to be taking up this space. I, people are noticing what I'm doing and I don't have to do it in a way that pleases this person, this person, and this person. And it, it you know, for the first time, it's uh, encouraging me to think about what, what else can I do from here? You know, who else can I collaborate with? What other things can I do beyond the scope of what I thought was normal and good and okay being surrounded by non-disabled artists? Oh, wow. And you actually just sort of touched upon something, well, three things that I want us to expand on. Because all of the, um, the nine um, artists who are in this exhibition all are either BIPOC or queer and trans or both. So that was really important to Hannah and I to make those decisions about who we, we wanted in the exhibition in that way because we all experience, um, the, well, this cohort of disabled people experiences marginalisation in all spaces. In BIPOC specific spaces, in spaces for queer and trans people and in spaces for disabled people as well. The other thing that you mentioned that I want to just talk about is the access stuff. We asked Bicole if we could have the gallery on the lower level only and if we could put up two big signs stating the reasons for that. And they let us do it. So I want to thank Bicole for doing that. Um, we blocked off the stairs, put up a big sign. We uh, put a big sign on the elevator and being able to do that was huge for us, particularly after the year we've had when we've faced so much um, <laughs> stuff. Hannah is cheering that. Um, so much stuff from our respective communities for calling out inaccessibility of, of uh, venues and Ruby is also nodding and I want, Ruby, I want you to talk about your experience with um, inaccessibility if you would mind. The thing for me is that ableism is so deeply ingrained in the foundations of our colonised society that it's not something that people are, it's not on a level that people are aware that it exists uh, or that they think it's something to be concerned by. You know, it's perfectly normal to have an entire street and every single shop could have a step to get into it. I can't go to house parties because no one's house is accessible. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of forget that. They think about like public access. They don't think about access within the homes. And, you know, when we're talking about access, usually people's idea of access means a ramp and not much beyond that. But access is so multifaceted and there are so many different types of access. And, you know, what's accessible for one disabled person might be completely inaccessible for someone else. And... Uh, so, you know, people are so ready to be like, oh, yeah, like things are, you know, progressing so well and everything's like changing and it's getting so much better. It's well, it's actually not because all of this stuff is still happening and all of these things are still inaccessible. Um, but there's that kind of expectation that disabled people are going to accept that. And, uh, you know, that's and that's a lot of why, I, you know, uh, I'm exploring the idea of protest because it's the assumption that disabled people are okay with uh, systemic oppression of not being able to access a space. But it, yeah, it's that kind of assumption that because we might not say something about it means that we can't or that we don't want to or that we're okay with it. And uh, I, yeah, I think protest and you know, the, the ability to question problematic things and broken systems 
is something that is not given, that is, that is denied to disabled people so frequently. Uh, and this kind of um, inherent way in which the disabled narrative is treated as public property and our bodies are treated as public property and, you know, the assumption that because I don't shave my legs, it's because I can't, not because I don't want to. I saw you nodding furiously. Could you talk a little bit about, you talked about how, well, Ruby just mentioned that access, it's not just about ramps and you live with a chronic illness. Could you talk a little bit about your experiences? Prior to the photo shoot, we met for the first time, not you and I, but you and Nino yeah. and I met together and we talked a lot about um, experiencing marginalisation in a lot of different kinds of spaces that we're all in, like all three of us are queer, all of the three of us are people of colour. So um, I, I'm wondering if you could talk to terms of inaccessibility that aren't just about mobility aids. Yeah, I think maybe I'm hesitant to talk about it because I guess my experience of chronic illness is so like tied into um, physical trauma that I've experienced and um, to complex trauma. So I guess my accessibility needs are really tied into um, having a really well-informed, like trauma-informed, centered kind of framework of, you know, how someone needs to be held and seen and supported. It's, I think people downplay accessibility in marginalised spaces because it's very easy to say we're dealing with so much already. Um, you know, if there's a queer event on, a lot of queer people have put a lot of effort into and it's a fundraiser for something, something. And then disabled people say, well, I can't enter the building. Well, they say they take that as a personal attack because they've done so much work and it's so hard and we're battling so many fronts. and. So accessibility just gets put to the bottom and I think disabled people get treated like they're being insensitive to someone's, you know, like huge project that they're doing and all the work that they've done <laughs> or whatever, um, which is obviously, you know, it's a cop out. And I mean, people do work really hard and they do do things, but that you also still need to do better <laughs> um, with accessibility because it's not... It's not okay that like a lot a lot of queer events aren't accessible and it's very easy for queers to just ignore disabled people because they literally can't attend the event, you know? Um, and it's this, like, that's what, you know, that's what will happen. People can just literally ignore it and then host events at inaccessible venues. And, you know, it's not just queers, it's like, you know, queer people of color as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did I answer that? I'm completely, not sure. Completely, completely, <laughs> yeah. I think the way that, I think that like a lot of the narratives and the way that uh, disabled people are portrayed, because it's been directed entirely by uh, non-disabled people for so long, it's become a very single faceted kind of lens that we have viewed through. And I think the disabled community is quite often viewed as being a monolith and kind of very, um, we're just kind of clumped all in together. And there's a lack of acknowledgement that we have so many different identities that, as well as disability. Um, and, and that we are, you know, no two disabled people are the same or have same experiences of the world or access requirements or identities. And I think like that's where, you know, when you're talking about you know, queer, queer people putting on events and being like, well, you know, we're already, you know, marginalized as it is. We, we don't have time to think about disabled people as well. Well, they're separating us out from that community and not realizing, well, actually we are queer as well as So this is a queer issue. Yeah, it is a queer issue. And people separate that out. They separate because quite often they're forgetting that disabled people are from all of these different communities and can cross over every other possible intersection that exists in the human existence an experience and people forget that, think they, they just kind of view disability through that one single, very med medicalised, sterilised lens um, and f forget that we are 
while yes, we are a valid community unto ourselves, we're also part of all of these other communities. And so an issue that affects us within these communities is something that needs to be taken seriously by these other communities because we're part of those communities. You know, I just had this thought as well. I think that it's really easy to sort of maybe profile a disabled person who's speaking up about ableism in a community or at an event or whatever. I think it's really easy for non-disabled people to say, well, that person's just really bitter and angry um, because they feel left out or whatever. They're like, they've got some chip on their shoulder because they have never interrogated like their understanding of disability and the fact that they subconsciously associate disability and chronic illness with suffering and negativity and something fearful. So less I think it's human. less than human. Yeah. So it's like their knee jerk response is to say, well, that person's just like fully bitter. And, you know, it's, I think it's a really um, lazy thing, but I think um, a lot of non-disabled people don't even get to the point of engaging with, like, unpacking um, their un unconscious and very conscious biases um, around disability. Um, yeah. and, we're, we're, and then it gets to the point where we're not allowed to be angry or bitter. Yeah, because I, that is feeding into yeah. that, 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 their understanding of us. And <laughs> what, like myself and, and quite a few other physically disabled people are reclaiming the, the slur or the, the title of the bitter cripple trope. Because uh, I am <laughs> quite often bitter. And I will reclaim that. And I'm, I'm allowing myself space to be bitter where previously I'm not given that opportunity mm -hmm. because I'm expected to be civil and polite and palatable because of non-disabled fragility. <laughs> I've got a question about the future, future of making art because um, you both talked about how you have been inspired by recent experiences to continue to make art. Um, and so I have a question about what your plans are, but also if you talk, talk a bit about what would support you as artists with disabilities to continue to make art and to actually consider it as something you could do full time, potentially. Um, me and Morak, my best friend, who I made the sculptural pieces with, um, Morak, just, we just signed up to um, have a zine stall. We've never made zines, but um, we just decided that we want to keep the momentum um, because, yeah, we didn't make our art for like the, the many months leading up to it, <laughs> to the exhibition. We left it so that we had like a week to really, we tried many times, okay? <laughs> but um, we left it to like a week. And so for a week we were just in, we were so deep in the creative process and it, it gave us so much life and so much joy. Um, like we didn't sleep, we had cuts all over our hand from the broken shards of mirror. Um, but it felt so right and so um, it evolved into something else as well. Like we had this, uh, our precon preconceptions about what our work wanted to be and what, it, what we wanted it to look like, but then it just took over and um, became what it, what, what we always wanted it to be, but we didn't know it could be. Um, so I think um, like moving forward and what we would need to make more of that is just someone as wonderful as Pauline. <laughs> that sort of like staunch love and like care um, that you have given to all the artists, um, um, that just did absolutely everything for my like self-esteem and my confidence to be able to make this work and to decide like, yeah, I wanna keep doing this. I'm not like just bad at creating things. It's just really hard <laughs> and it's wonderful when you have the right supports um, in place to be able to do that. Um, so, yeah. This, this has really kind of um, inspired me to keep uh, I want to create art for the disabled gays with a Z but also, but also gays. gays. <laughs>
love to create a sort of installation-based exhibition of my own that uh, has a couple of different ways of accessing it and that the majority of the experience is tailored to disabled people and non-disabled people kind of get a somewhat more filtered experience of it. I'm not sure how I would go about doing that. I've got lots of different ideas in my head. So that's kind of my where um, my brain's at at the moment. Probably the best way to close the discussion, I reckon. <laughs> Could you please thank um, the artists for their contribution? <laughs> thank you, Ada Hannah.